Welcome to the third video lecture in <coughs> week 4 of discrete mathematics. So we continue with our study of induction. So just a quick recap of what we have done till now. We have been studying various proof techniques for proving a statement like A implies B. We have seen some trick, uh, tricks about how to solve, split a problem into smaller problems or how removing some redundant assumptions can be helpful or how sometimes proving something harder can actually be easier. We also looked at some of the proof techniques, namely we looked at the direct proof technique where you work with A and prove B. Sometimes we go in a backward direction, namely with, we work with B and simplify to get something C so that proving A implies C is easier than proving A implies B. We also saw the case study where we can split the assumptions into an order of a finite number of them and that in turn helps us to split the problem into and of a finite number of subproblems. Namely, if A equals to C or D, then A implies B is same as C implies B and D implies B. We also saw two ways of looking at the problem in different ways, namely proof by contradiction and proof by contradictiveness. In one case, we'll, instead of proving A implies B, we end up proving that not B and A is false. And in the other case, we prove not B implies not A. For certain cases, particularly when B is of the form C or D, then the second technique, namely proof by contrapositiveness, helps. We also saw how one can prove, disprove a statement, particularly if a statement is of the form for all x, a implies bx, one can disprove it by demonstrating a x for which <coughs> ax holds but bx doesn't hold. And this is what we call as proof by counterexample. So this is the proof technique that are there and we also looked at another one which is the topic of this week namely induction. So just in the case of the case studies where we can split up the assumptions into finite number of cases, here the assumption can be split up into an infinite number of cases and that in turn helps to split up the problem into an infinite number of cases and and of all of them. So the problem of A implies B can be split up into and of infinitely many problems or subproblems. The subproblems are indexed by some parameter of the input. So the so this statement A implies B gets written as P1 and P2 and dot dot till infinity. So this is the and of an infinite number of problems. We have seen how to split up some of the problems into this infinite number of subproblems naturally. In particular, we saw how to split up the sum of first n integers as n into n plus 1 by 2. This can be done by Instead of proving directly that for all n this is true, let's first define for pk to be the problem which says that prove that 1 to k, sum of 1 to k is k into 1 k plus 1 by 2 and then the problem can be stated as for all k prove that this statement pk is true. Similarly, for the case problem of 11 divides 23 power n minus 1, one can turn, write it as and of pk is where pk is 11 divides 23 power k minus 1. 
And thirdly, we looked at the A and B of inequality. Again, the same statement holds where if we define PK as sum of the, or the average, the arithmetic mean of K of real numbers is greater than the geometric mean of the K real numbers. And you want to prove that for all K, uh, for all K, the PK is true. Now, this is the way of splitting the problem into infinitely number, uh, smaller number of, so infinitely many number of sub-problems. Now, how do we go about proving it? So, the main idea is, of course, that we first of all cannot end up proving all the sub-problems because there are infinitely many. But the idea is that we can first prove P1 is true, then we can prove that if for some k greater than or equal to 1, pk is true, then we can prove that pk plus 1 is true. And this will in turn help us to prove pn is true for all n. The idea again is that if here is a real line and this says that the first one says that okay p1 is true, the second statement says that okay since 1 is true therefore 2 is true, since 2 is true therefore 3 is true and so on. So thus I end up proving this pi for all the natural numbers. So in other words this step would help us to finish or cover all the possible pi assuming that we manage to make a start which is in this case p1 is true right but again the fact that this whole thing do work and this is no major fallacy in the involved in this whole process is guaranteed by what is known as the principle of mathematical induction it's an axiom in the in computer in math which says that indeed this kind of approach works. Thus to prove a statement of this form there are three parts to it. So to prove that for all k greater than or equal to 1 proving that pk is true first of all there is a base case where you prove p1 is true then second is the induction hypothesis where you prove that pk is true or you assume that pk is true for some k greater than or equal to 1 and finally assuming the induction hypothesis you prove pk plus 1 is true. Now we saw a couple of examples last couple of videos on how to use this particular mathematical induction to solve problems. Now let's see there different versions of mathematical induction. There are quite a number of different versions of mathematical induction and let's look at the second different version. So the second different version is like instead of, so till now we have looked at a problem which are of the form for all k greater than or equal to 1, pk is true. But now instead of this 1, if I replace it with some any other integer r, then what happens? So if pk is for k greater than or equal to r, if I ask pk is true, then how do you solve it? The idea is again kind of similar, that we have the real line, here is r, I want to prove that pr is true, I want to prove that pr plus 1 is true, and so on and so forth. So the idea is again similar, the only difference is that you have to convert change the base case. So the base case here will become that the PR, the RF place is true. And of course the induction hypothesis is that PK is true for some K greater than or equal to R, then we want to use the inductive step to prove that you use inductive hypothesis to prove that pk plus 1 is true. Note that if I end up doing it, by the base case I know r is true, 
and by this inductive step I know okay since r is true therefore r plus 1 is true since r plus since r plus 1 is true therefore r plus 2 is true and so on and so forth so it goes on and on for proving all the uh, pn for all the n now let's see how one can apply this particular version to get an another a proof of a problem So consider this problem, for all n greater than or equal to 5, 2 power n is greater than n square. Now if I just go back one slide, you can realize that this problem fits very much in this framework where for all k greater than r instead of that we have for all n greater than or equal to 5. P, uh, 2 power n is greater than n square. So first of all, how do you split it up? What are the pi's? Of course, the pi that the form pk is the that prove that 2 power k is greater than k square. And the problem is restated as for all k greater than 5, pk is true. Now we will apply the mathematical induction, the version 2 of that for obtaining the proof of this. Okay, so what all things we have to prove for that? First of all, we have to prove the base case, namely P5 is true. We have the induction hypothesis, which says that for all k or for some k, pk is true, and then using that assuming pk is true proves that pk plus 1 is true. Once you get it in this form, it should be a standard straightforward proof from now on. So let's just put everything in perspective by put, plugging in the what are the statements of pk, p plus, plus 1 and p5. So the base case is to prove 2 power 5 is greater than 5 squared. Induction hypothesis for some, of course, we we'll let for some k 2 power k is greater than k square, and then inductive step assuming 2 power k is greater than k square prove that 2 power k plus 1 is greater than k plus 1 whole square. Now, to start with the base case, how do we prove the base case? Okay, this is kind of a standard easy thing to verify. That 2 power 5 is 32, which is greater than 25, which is equal to 5 square. Hence, the base case is true. The induction hypothesis says that for some k, let for some k, 2 power k is bigger than k square. Now, assuming this one, we have to go ahead and prove the inductive state. So, we have to prove that 2 power k plus 2 is bigger than k plus 1 whole square. In other words, this 2 power k plus 1 is equal to 2 times 2 power k. Now this 2 power k is of course greater than k square by the induction hypothesis. So by induction hypothesis, sorry this should be 2 power k, 2 power k is bigger than k square. So 2 power k plus 1 is bigger than 2 times k square. Now, <coughs> note that this is what we have to prove, or this is why it is enough to prove that 2 power k square is bigger than k plus 1 whole square. Now, why is this one true? I leave it to, uh, to you guys to check why this is true. You have to apply one of these techniques that we have learned so far in the last couple of weeks and prove that for any k, 2 power k square is greater than k plus 1 whole square. Right? And thus we will be getting that 2 power k plus 1 is greater than k plus 1 whole square.
Now, the things to note here is that, first of all, 